Good evening, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, Marketing Specialist, and I'll be your moderator. We're excited to welcome Linda D'Amico as our speaker today, as she will explain why patients say, ouch, don't touch this, and other things. Before we get started, we've got a few reminders for you. At any point during tonight's webinar, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll reply via email within two business days. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand, and this webinar is sponsored by Colgate. Linda, thanks for being with us tonight. Well, thank you, Adam, for that introduction. I really appreciate everyone being here today. So we're going to talk about dentin hypersensitivity. Ouch, don't touch this, and other things patients say. I'm Linda D'Amico with Colgate Oral Pharmaceuticals, and we will get started here. So when you look at this nice, cold, ice cold glass of water, you know, I live in Arizona. So to us, when we see this, especially in the summer and it's 115 degrees out, this looks really refreshing and it looks, you know, like something you're gonna want right away. But if you have dentin hypersensitivity, you see this glass of ice cold water and you're going to avoid it. It does not look refreshing. It doesn't look comfortable. You may be really, really thirsty and it may be really, really hot out, but you're not going to drink this ice cold glass of water. So what we're gonna talk about is, we're gonna define the mechanism of dentin hypersensitivity, describe the steps in a differential diagnosis, for dentin hypersensitivity, select the appropriate preventative and therapeutic solutions available for the patient. So let's look at the mechanism of dentin hypersensitivity. So when it's dentin hypersensitivity, that's that short, sharp pain, almost like a zinger effect. It can feel like lightning to those areas. It arises from that exposed dentin it's in response to an external stimuli, and it cannot be ascribed to any other form of dental defect or disease. So you have to make a correct differential diagnosis. That is the key to manage it successfully. So as you see here, the pain and that exposed area and an external stimuli, so how do patients meet this challenge? They avoid that pain eliciting activity. That's the main priority. So that cold glass of water, the ice cubes, the ice cream, the really cold foods, if it's a cold sensitivity, um, you know, we just avoid that when we have dentin hypersensitivity. They have different coping mechanisms. Uh, maybe if they have one of these items, you know, kind of suck their cheek in, um, different things. A lot of times um, patients will just adapt their behavior to avoid that pain, or they just kind of deal with it. They don't enjoy it, but they're used to it. Um, oftentimes they're willing to try anything to get rid of sensitivity. I mean, this is a high priority. It doesn't feel good. And that's why, you know, sensitive toothpastes are so popular and they're everywhere in the stores. That's because patients, oftentimes there's a lot of them that have sensitivity and they're looking for anything to give them some kind of relief. Usually they'll try any oral care product to get that relief. And the thing to keep in mind is that cost may not be an issue. Now there's other procedures as we know where cost sometimes is an issue for those patients. They may want implants, they may want veneers, they may want a lot of restorative work and they really have to weigh if they can afford it and how to go about that, right? We're used to that in the dental office. When it comes to sensitivity relief and methods that we can help them meet that challenge, Cost oftentimes is not the issue. There are really easy, simple ways to help our patients. So definitely something to keep in mind for them. So how it affects quality of life. Oftentimes it is cold that causes sensitivity, but it could be certain drinks, sweets, um, scraping of a metal utensil, uh, breathing in air. Sometimes people who live in really cold climates and they're outside a lot, that cold air across their teeth. They'll try to avoid that. 
um, routine oral hygiene practices. That is huge because when you see that patient that has poor plaque control, they have a lot of plaque interproximal. They don't clean their teeth very well in some areas. Oftentimes, it might not be that they don't know how to clean those areas. They're avoiding them because of pain. So we really want to try to help these patients. So what are some of those stimuli? Cold, like I said, hot. For some patients, hot can really bother those areas. Tactile. So that could be a toothbrush, floss, an interproximal aid, anything to stimulate the pain in those areas, that is something that they will avoid. Osmotic, sweets and sours. For some patients, anything really sweet will really bother the teeth. And sometimes something really sour will do that. Um, evaporative, that dehydration of oral fluids the suction or the air blast. Oftentimes that's how we have to really check those areas. We want to spray some air in those areas. Um, many times as a hygienist myself, I would get that patient all ready to have their teeth cleaned and I get everything ready to go. And I put that suction in and have them turn toward me. And they're like, oh, <gasps> Ouch, you know, so if you've ever had that happen with your patient, you know that they may not have expressed that they have dent hypersensitivity, but you get that air going in there and it's really painful for them. And I am going to talk about better ways to manage that for those patients. And then also chemicals, acids, that could be um, acidic beverages, acidic foods. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that as well. But all of those things can stimulate that pain. So you want to be sure that you exclude, um, you know, other, other causes of the pain. So you do a visual exam, you evaluate their nasal congestion, their sinuses, that could be causing some sensitivity, having sinus congestion, occlusal exam, radiographs, we want to really, you know, see what's going on percussion, mobility, bite stick, you can transilluminate, and you could also do a thermal and a pulp test. And definitely that will help you to exclude other factors, other pain causes. Is it dental caries? Is it a fractured restoration? Could it be a chipped tooth, inflammation, post-restorative sensitivity? You know, I'm um, of that age where I had a lot of those uh, amalgams, as you see pictured here on the bottom. And as I got older, they became crowns, some of them. And I didn't know what that felt like until I had all that restor restorative work done. And after that prep and once the anesthesia wore off and I had that temporary on, man, that was really, really sensitive because those areas were now exposed that had not been. And I thought I was pretty tough to pain, but boy, that will really get you. That can really, really hurt for patients. And then they're going to associate that with the dental work that they had. Um, marginal leakage, of course, pulpitis and a cracked tooth. All of these other factors need to be excluded before determining that it is truly dentin hypersensitivity. So when you have that gingival recession, um, the exposure of the root surfaces and loss of cementum, that's when you start seeing more hypersensitivity. So that usually comes with age. Um, oftentimes your hypersensitive patients are adults, they're usually over 20. Um, and oftentimes they're, you know, from about that age till about 60. And when they get older, which I'll talk about a little bit more, sometimes that sensitivity naturally kind of recedes, but um, incorrect brushing technique can definitely, you know, be a big cause as you see in the photos here. Um, you know, sometimes the beginning of that is that really hard scrubbing with hard bristle brushes. And those patients are, um, maybe they're trying to make up for not spending a lot of time on their oral hygiene, or they're not flossing, and they're not doing other things to clean between their teeth. So they brush really hard, and they think that's the solution and that they're doing a great job because of it. You also have, of course, periodontal disease and procedures. So for those patients that are having those first-time procedures, 
um, experiencing periodontal disease usually goes hand in hand with dental hypersensitivity. As soon as they start having that recession and those exposed areas, they're going to get that pain. And so routine in-office dental procedures also will contribute. The metal explorer, you know, we have to check those areas. We're doing our exam um, and you can really hit on some spots for those patients and, you know, they about jump out of the chair, right? Um, use of compressed air. So spraying that air, that cold blast, I have to admit, it always kind of gets me a little in some spots. It's just kind of like, whoa, it's just really strong. Um, of course, root planing, periodontal debridement. Um, they have that wall of calculus over, the, um, over their teeth, especially on the lingual sides, and you remove it, and now those areas are exposed. And of course, the water temperature from power scalers or air polishers, we want to always be sure that the temperature is correct, that it is warm and not cold, because um, that really um, strong scaling effect along with the water can be very painful for for those patients. So when we have loss of enamel, we have abrasion, attrition, abfraction, erosion, or the removal for restorative procedures. These can all be causes of that. So when we look at caries versus erosion, caries is of course a demineralization of the tooth structure it's below an intact surface, it's due to bacterial acids. It's non-cavitated caries can be remineralized though, and it is reversible in that really early non-cavitated stage. And then with erosion, we have demineralization of the tooth structure. It begins at the surface. It's due to those acids other than those produced by bacteria. It involves immediate substance loss and remineralization is much less likely. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. So those acids from outside the body, you have the dietary, that is the most common, acidic drinks, fruits, acidic sweets, salad dressing and vinegar. Um, you know, when you think about a lot of our patients and a lot of um, people these days, you know, want to have a healthy diet. We want to eat more salad. We want to have more healthy foods in our diet. But oftentimes patients are unaware that those diets could be very acidic and it could be leading to some of their dentin hypersensitivity. Um, medications, vitamin C, um, I think a lot of us are taking more vitamin C these days, right? So vitamin C we know is very acidic, um, aspirin is, and then of course, occupational causes, industrial, certain um, careers, People are breathing in chemicals and um, you have the metal industry. Another one um, with the occupational is swimmers. So people who swim a lot or they lifeguard or they're in water with chemicals, oftentimes they will have more dent hypersensitivity as well. And that's because they're getting that, um, that acidic exposure from, um, from the chemicals in the pool. So when we look at foods um, and drinks, soft drink consumption has increased by 500% in the past 50 years. I mean, really think about that. Um, it's incredible how much it is just part of our culture now for um, adults and children. And a lot of people just drink soft drinks. And when I was a kid, it was a treat. And we didn't have them at my house uh, very often. So, you know, nowadays, most homes in America, they're going to have some kind of sodas in the refrigerator. Um, on average, each American consumes greater than 56 gallons a year. I bet if you share that with your patients who drink soda, they might be kind of surprised, but, um, but it's quite a bit. And about 80% of 14-year-olds drink greater than 20 ounces of soft drinks daily. Um, I happen to have a 13 year old and it is difficult. You know, they're in different environments. They're not always with you. They're at other people's houses. They're playing sports. They're um, in different environments where oftentimes, you know, they're going to be offered sugary drinks. And sometimes people aren't even aware that Gatorades and some of these other sports drinks, that they're very acidic as well. So 
they're being exposed to acids on a daily basis, probably more so than a lot of older adults were. And it's not just the sodas. Um, you know, some of these guys, we know they're acidic. We know Coke is acidic. We know Dr. Pepper. Um, but sometimes people aren't aware that Sprite is really acidic. Um, sometimes I ask other parents, you know, what they think. And they'll say, well, Sprite's better because it's light or ginger ale, a light color, but it's, it's not less acidic. It's still very acidic. Um, coffee, of course, iced tea, but some, you know, sometimes people are surprised like carrot juice. They might not think of that as being acidic, but it is, it's not as bad as others, but it is on the acidic side. And of course, some bottled waters, a lot of times your flavored bottled waters, um, they are actually acidic. Anything that has anything added to it pretty much, right? So, and it's not just the drinks, you know, apples, apricots, um, but blueberries, you might not think of them being acidic. Um, also plums, ketchup, you know, how many kids eat ketchup with their fries? How many of us do, right? Ketchup's pretty acidic. Also salad dressings, uh, mayonnaise, mustard, um, yogurt, sour cream, you know, some things are kind of obvious to us, but to our patients, they may not be aware that um, the foods they're eating are very acidic and it is contributing to that enamel erosion. And so definitely, I think it's important to talk to our patients about their diets and even the healthy diets. We need to make sure that they are aware that they should be drinking some plain water as well to um, help combat that. Then you also have the in intrinsic acids. That's your backflow gastric contents. You have GERD, you have bulimia. You could have um, patients who have morning sickness and they're having a lot more um, backflow of stomach acid into their mouth. Um, oftentimes, you know, uh, we're starting to see more young people. We're seeing more, you know, teens that have heartburn, you know, these days. And I think a lot of it is the American diet, you know, everybody's kind of on the go. And if you're on the go and you're picking food up on a way to a sport event and we just left school and all that we're doing um, with kids, oftentimes, um, you know, they're having very acidic foods and they're getting more stomach issues. So these are definitely things to uh, be aware of. And oftentimes it's a combination of factors. You have that acidic diet, you could have some bruxism, gastric acids and improper oral hygiene habits, um, you know, definitely. So the already have the acidic diet going on and then we're brushing too hard. Maybe um, for those patients, they feel, you know, their mouth doesn't feel very clean because of their diet. And so they try to make up for it, but they're actually causing more harm than good. So attrition, of course, is that wear that's produced by direct tooth to tooth contact and that could lead to these areas. Then you have erosion plus attrition. Um, the cupping effect, when I first graduated from dental hygiene school, I worked in a retirement area and I saw these teeth a lot. Um, definitely in older patients, you'll see where the erosion and that cupping and that flattening has occurred um, on their teeth and they're very eroded. So of course, abrasion, which is the mechanical wear produced by an external source. So oftentimes this is the hard bristle brushes, the improper technique. Sometimes, um, you know, I saw a lot of patients who liked to use toothpicks. Um, it was very hard to convince somebody who's been using a toothpick their whole life um, to not use a toothpick to pick their teeth on a regular basis. But, you know, the toothpicks and um, different things that people will use to get um, between their teeth, anything to avoid flossing sometimes, but the, really it's that mechanical wear. And this is so common to see in patients, especially adults. So when you have erosion plus abrasion, you could have that acidic diet, aggressive oral hygiene. You know, oftentimes these are the mouths that you're going to be seeing. And, you know, upon first glance, um, things can look pretty clean. It looks like this patient 
um, gets interproximal. They do a pretty decent job, but they're really being way too aggressive. And so you have to really educate them about that. And as you see here with these erosion areas, you know, once again, you don't really see plaque, but you see a lot of recession. You see these little cupped out areas and um, it's basically being eroded and that could be that combination of factors. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about saliva. I mean, we know saliva is so important for eating, for talking, for speaking, for um, everything that our mouths do. It helps buffer that salivary pH, um, provides the minerals and the fluoride to um, back into the enamel. But if you have xerostomia, you have dry mouth, you're at a higher risk for hard tissue loss. Some of the causes of xerostomia could be prescription drugs, a lot of people on prescription drugs, um, radiation therapy, systemic diseases, conditions, and of course, illicit drug use, um, which a lot of these things are on the rise these days. And, you know, definitely the side effect of almost every medication, I think, um, but a lot of medications cause dry mouth. And so if you have 25 million people in the United States experiencing medication-induced dry mouth, that's a lot of your patients. And so you have all of these factors going in and they can definitely um, contribute to that dental hypersensitivity. Some of the symptoms of dry mouth is, you know, it's very interesting, but the patient could have 50% less saliva flow than normal before they are even aware they have dry mouth. So not until they get down to about 50%. So that means they've had this going on usually for a while. It just, they didn't feel it yet. So they were losing that natural buffering effect of their saliva. They're losing that um, protection factor for quite a while. And um, especially if you add in the aggressive brushing, the acidic diet, all of these things are really contributing strongly to their dentin hypersensitivity and to that gingival recession. Oftentimes those patients, they're carrying fluids around more. Um, they may not, maybe they didn't used to worry about it, but now they're having to carry more water with them, um, waking up at night to get something to drink. And of course, so now how we're contributing to the sensitivity with dry mouth, they're oftentimes they are having sugary, hard candies, um, throat lozenges. You know, if you check out at the grocery store, right at the checkout counters, all that stuff. So it's very tempting to buy. You have all the little candies and stuff. And um, it's oftentimes not the healthy ones. It's the ones that are, you know, very popular. So patients will buy these things and they are constantly exposing their teeth to these acids. So as a hygienist, I always love seeing that blanket of calculus, as you see pictured on the right. I just love removing it and seeing the health that comes from it. But what's going on here is, um, you know, this is a patient, maybe it's been quite a while, obviously, since they've had any dental care. And, you know, you're going to get in there and you're going to remove this and you're going to make things healthy. But what's going to happen is, they're going to have those exposed areas and they, this is very likely to lead to dentin hypersensitivity. How common is it? Well, if it's about one in four patients, you know, in any typical day, a typical dental hygiene schedule, if you see, you know, eight patients, then you're gonna at least see a couple of them, you know, that are going to have dentin hypersensitivity. And 15% of the time, Everything's pretty healthy, but they have some areas that are hypersensitive. And definitely most periodontally compromised patients will have dent hypersensitivity. They may only experience it briefly. It might be acute. It may get better, um, but they definitely usually will have it. So we want to help those patients um, manage it and hopefully lessen it for them because They'll associate that oftentimes with the treatment that you provided. They'll think you caused that sensitivity. So you definitely want to be really, um, you know, educating them and managing that for them and providing them treatment options. So, you know, when you think about why do so many patients, you know, who are periodontally compromised, 
Why do they experience that dental hypersensitivity? And for all those reasons, they're losing that blanket of calculus. They're losing the protection of their soft tissues. And as those areas are now exposed, they will be sensitive. I worked in periodontal offices for a long time. And um, I think pretty much it was pretty much every patient will experience dental hypersensitivity. So we did a lot of treatments and I will share with you at the end um, some tips on that. So when we look at dentin hypersensitivity and what's going on, we have these open dentinal tubules and it creates a pathway that allows that stimuli to provoke a painful response. And I wanna show you kind of an example with this straw. So if you think about a straw having, you know, it's an open tubule here, and if you have fluid in it, which I don't because I don't wanna spill it on myself, but if I have water in here, um, and you close the ends and you kind of do this motion, that's kind of what's going on as you have a fluid flow from one end to the other. And when it gets to the nerve, it creates that pain response. So Branstone's hydrodynamic theory is basically that you have an outside stimulus, it causes that fluid flow, it goes down to the nerve and that fluid flow, that motion and that exposure causes the pain signal that goes to the brain and ouch. So sometimes it can be kind of hard to determine who's going to be sensitive or not sensitive. So when we look at these mouths here, like, well, is this sensitive or not sensitive? You know, you look at these cupped out teeth here. And when I was a new graduate, I thought, oh my gosh, this must be so painful when I worked with older patients. And um, oftentimes, no, they'd say it doesn't bother them one bit. They don't want you to do anything. They're fine with their teeth the way they are, right? Um, no sensitivity. And then you see this patient, some sensitivity, you know, you definitely want to um, really do that differential diagnosis, make sure um, it isn't something else. You can see where there's been restorative work and possibly they have not um, been doing the greatest home care and they're probably overdue to see you. And this patient might have some sensitivity, could be dentin hypersensitivity, could be um, caries, could be a number of things. So we wanna really determine what is the cause. And then this patient you see looks pretty good, you know, things look pretty healthy, but this one little area right here is so sensitive that she's afraid to even come in and see you because she thinks you're going to scrape that area. You're going to spray air, water, whatever it may be. She um, doesn't eat ice cream. She doesn't drink cold water. She has to drink everything room temperature. Um, it's really not a comfortable thing. And so for this patient, this one area is really intense and we want to really help manage that for them. So when we think about the patients who had no sensitivity, um, they have those cupped out kind of sclerosed areas. Oftentimes that's because um, the number of the open tubules and the diameter is much, much smaller. And so that fluid flow is not occurring the same. So with the sclerosis, what's going on is over time, your natural process is minerals will deposit within the tubules, and then it decreases that diameter of the tubules. It decreases the fluid flow. So they kind of naturally desensitize. And this, this usually doesn't happen until, um, until patients are much older, um, it can take years for this to happen. Um, they form that secondary and tertiary dentin and the donoblast, they basically from the, form the dentin on the floor and the roof of the pulp and it insulates it from that fluid flow. So when we do our differential diagnosis, we want to look at, you know, what's going on. So 50%, so half of your sensitivity sufferers won't say anything. Um, that's, you know, the patient where you put the suction in their mouth and now they kind of have to say something because it is very painful for them. But, and then you're surprised many times I'd be like, oh my gosh, you know, you didn't say that you had sensitivity and they didn't report it. So, um, you definitely want to ask them some good questions besides 
are your teeth sensitive? That's kind of a yes or a no. So ask them some really good questions. Um, you know, do you avoid certain foods? Do you avoid beverages? Or is there any activity that, you know, causes sensitivity to your teeth? That could be brushing. Are you avoiding brushing some areas? Are you not flossing? Are you not um, getting in there because they're sensitive? And also, um, can you let me know if you're feeling any sensitivity during your appointment? Most of the times they will let you know because it's really hurt, hurting them, but, um, but not always. They might not um, say something because they're worried you're going to suggest something that, um, that they're, not, they're not ready for, or they think that it's more serious than it is, but there's some really easy um, cost-effective treatment methods that I will go over at the end. But um, when you look at the dentin hypersensitivity decision tree, you wanna you know, see what is their chief complaint? What are the symptoms? Is this a short, sharp pain? Um, almost like lightning hits it. Is it um, from cold? That's the most common, but it could be hot. It could be touch. It could be dietary acids. Um, is it spontaneous? Is it lingering? One, we also wanna of course review their history. Do they, have they always kind of overbrushed? Are they overzealous? Um, improper brushing, brushing too hard, using really hard bristle brushes and trying to really overdo it as fast as they can. Um, what about bruxism? What about acidic diet? Um, you know, you got to look at that and your patients who are eating a healthy diet, we want to commend them. That's a great thing, but they may not be aware that a lot of fruits and vegetables and um, sauces and salad dressings and things are very acidic. Um, also, have they had periodontal treatment? Have they had periodontal surgery? Um, is this, you know, a lingering severe pain? Has this been going on for, you know, a short period of time? How long have you had this? What's going on? Do we have a lot of restorations, malocclusion? Are they high caries risk? Um, clinical exam, we want to see, you know, is there gingival recession? We want to check those areas um, like that one slide previously that I showed. It could be very subtle, that spot. Um, you know, where is this exposed done? And of course, we want to see if there's caries, cracked teeth, pulpitis, abscesses, History of whitening, you know, sometimes patients are whitening their teeth on a pretty regular basis. And if it's, you know, something that they've purchased on their own, they um, may not tell you that. They, they might, they might not. They might be worried that, um, you know, maybe they shouldn't be using it because it's actually causing sensitivity, but they really like to, to have that white, bright smile. They want white teeth. So they're using different products. Um, maybe they're overusing them if they're doing whitening all the time. Um, you know, all of these things. Of course, occlusal trauma, sinus inflammation. You know, um, right now where I'm at in Arizona, it is allergy season. We have um, spring going on. We have flowers blooming. So a lot of people have sinus congestion right now, and that could be causing some sensitivity, that pressure. So you want to confirm that diagnosis. You want to um, expose the tooth to the external stimulus. And that could be the explorer, it could be some cold water, um, all those things to just really check. And um, if that all comes through positive, then I would say it's dentin hypersensitivity. Um, and then we can look at care recommendations. And then of course you may have to do other diagnostic tests just to confirm that, um, you know, whether it could be something else. We wanna make sure, um, is this bruxism, is this bite stress? Is, you know, we wanna do an occlusal assessment and just be sure, is it a cracked tooth? Um, what is that actually going on here? So some preventative strategies for managing that dentin hypersensitivity is, of course, we want to educate our patients um, that aggressive, incorrect brushing, uh, you know, oftentimes I would have the patient, you know, can you show me how you're brushing your teeth? What kind of brush are you using? Um, they may not even be aware that it is a hard bristle toothbrush. Um, asking them when you uh, use your toothbrush, how soon or does it? What happens? Are the bristles straight after you've been using it for a couple of weeks or are they like this? <laughs> if they're all splayed out, that's a sign that you're overbrushing. They should not splay out. Um, 
are you grinding your teeth? You know, oftentimes patients, uh, you know, it can be stress related, different reasons why a lot of people grind, a lot of people clench, acidic foods and beverages, um, you know, talk to the patient about that, even the healthy diet, you know, um, let them know, you know, they may want to drink a glass of water after eating something very acidic or switch off. I'd say, you know, I don't expect you to give up coffee. I know I'm not willing to, but drink a glass of water, something to, um, to just kind of, kind of flush that out as well. Of course, frequent vomiting, periodontal treatment, um, you know, show them those really good brushing techniques, um, and diet counseling, like I said, avoiding the sugary acidic beverages. And I think that's a tough one these days because a lot of students, uh, workers, a lot of your patients, a lot of people are working from home, like I am, um, you know, they're, they're on their computers often and time goes so quickly and they may not even be aware how many sodas they've had because they're, you know, at a desk and they're, um, you know, it's easy to just grab one. Maybe they need to get up and stretch and they reach for a Coke, you know, so I think that you're going to see a lot of, a lot more patients who have, um, maybe they are having more acidic beverages and more caffeine and more stuff like that, more coffee, you know, during the day that normally they wouldn't have. So, so what are some of our therapeutic solutions? So to manage dentin hypersensitivity, we have our in-office treatments and daily home care. So also what goes with that is oral hygiene instructions. We want to talk to them about their diet and identify and refer for treatment when needed. So definitely um, look at those diets, look at how much time they're spending on their teeth, what kind of brush, what, um, you know, what's happening with their toothbrush. Is it splaying out? Is it falling apart? Um, these all could be signs of aggressive toothbrushing. And also, you know, if they are, you know, you ask them and you may even notice it when, when they're in the dental chair, are they constantly having, um, you know, heartburn? Are they, you know, kind of burping a lot? Any, any of these signs could be a sign that they are getting more stomach acid and um, they may not go to their doctor regularly. And so that might be something you want to talk to them about, about seeing a medical professional and really being sure that it isn't something more serious. And maybe, um, maybe there's something that they could take that would help for that. So when we look at those treatment options for dentin hypersensitivity, we have one of the most common is desensitizing the nerves with potassium nitrate. And we also have occluding the dentin tubules. And one of the most common when we're talking about toothpaste is stannous fluoride will occlude tubules. And your sensitive, your sodium fluorides and potassium nitrate desensitize. Two very common, um, very popular types of toothpaste. And, you know, probably one of the most common that patients will grab when they're in the store is a sensitive toothpaste. If they have dentin hypersensitivity, they're typically using a toothpaste that says for sensitivity on the side. So that's another thing um, to ask them. What kind of toothpaste do you buy? What toothpaste are you using? Um, depolarizing the nerves with potassium salts can actually work pretty well. Um, what happens is those potassium ions, you know, they have to they kind of have to build up and establish that gradient and move against that fluid flow to depolarize the nerve. It takes time. Sounds funny, but um, you know, it's really important to emphasize to your patients that this takes time for it to work. Sometimes, you know, patients will use something for a couple days and they decide, I don't think it worked for me. And I would see them the next visit and ask them, did that sensitive toothpaste, how did, what did you think? And they'd say it didn't work. Well, how long did you use it? Oh, I didn't like it. So I used it a couple of days. They really need to use it at least twice a day for minimum two weeks to really feel this effect. So we really want to tell those patients that are using a sensitive toothpaste with potassium nitrate to give it some time and to let it work. And then, um, and then they should be feeling less sensitivity. 
especially if it's just mild sensitivity. So what you're looking for with your sensitive toothpaste is usually the word sensitive. And then when it comes to the ingredients, your two active ingredients are 5% potassium nitrate and neutral sodium chloride. With Colgate, our prescription brand is Prevident, and we do have two variants for sensitivity. The um, probably the most popular one is the Prevident 5000 Sensitive. It is prescription strength, 5000 parts per million, and the 5% potassium nitrate. This is a great product to or therapy to recommend and prescribe to your patients, um, to have them go home with it, especially if they're about to go through procedures that may cause some sensitivity, um, like whitening, restorations, um, you know, various things. Maybe they're about to have periodontal treatment and they've never had it before. Um, you know, very, um, a, a lot of reasons why, or patients who they've tried sensitive toothpaste and it's just kind of, you know, kind of works kind of okay, but they still have sensitivity. That prescription strength sensitive toothpaste can really make all the difference um, for those patients because they get that really nice dose of fluoride, which helps protect the enamel, helps protect those exposed areas. And then they also get the sensitivity benefit. You also have tubule occlusion. And so when it comes to tubule occlusion, um, the outer surface actually becomes occluded. It gets blocked. That pain signal, that lightning bolt cannot get down in there to the brain and so uh, to the pulp, so, uh, which then sends it to the brain. So you want to relieve hypersensitivity by blocking that external stimulus when you occlude the tubules. A toothpaste with stannous fluoride that is a whole mouth toothpaste. So that would be ours, Colgate Total, um, is a stabilized stannous fluoride with zinc phosphate. And what that does is they get the benefit of the fluoride, they get their caries benefit, um, enamel strengthening, of course, fresh breath. But what's also really amazing about stannous fluoride is it does help with plaque, gingivitis control, and a sensitivity benefit because of that occlusion of the tubules. So you want to recommend for those patients that need all of these benefits besides sensitivity, a nice toothpaste like Colgate Total Stannous Fluoride um, because they will get all the benefits. So they're getting the plaque gingivitis, they're also getting the sensitivity because it's occluding the tubules. And a stabilized stannous fluoride will not cause staining. It will not cause a bad taste and um, they get the benefits of that. So that can oftentimes be a really easy thing to recommend to those patients. Um, your in-office treatments and then if they're going to use an over-the-counter toothpaste, uh, determine which one works. If they've used a sensitive paste and it didn't really work really great and over the counter one, you know, you could try a stabilized stannous fluoride. And so as you can see here, it builds up right on that edge and blocks those tubules. And definitely it's clinically proven to reduce sensitivity, air blast and tactile. And, you know, once again, you wanna recommend with any of these products for that patient to give it time. You gotta use it, you gotta use it a while, at least a good couple weeks for it to really work its magic. So let's look at some other therapeutic solutions. Um, definitely we wanna try to prevent if we can, um, you know, get to it before it gets really bad for those patients to go over those oral health instructions, dietary advice. We can manage it with in-office treatments and daily home care as well. So I'm going to talk about those. One that is the most common in-office treatment would be fluoride varnish. You also have arginine and calcium carbonate, which is the pro-argin technology, and then stannous fluoride. So let's talk a little bit about Prevenant Varnish. With varnish, it is 5% sodium fluoride. It's 22,600 parts per million fluoride. With ours, with the Prevenant, there are four flavors. They are ready to use unit doses, um, available in, of course, great tasting flavors. But that one unit dose will cover um, definitely those hypersensitive areas and will cover the entire dentition if needed, but really you wanna really concentrate on those areas. Um, what's really great about 
fluoride varnish is it sets up rapidly um, on contact with saliva. And so there's really, you know, almost, I always say it's almost impossible to swallow varnish because if you're getting it right where you need to put it, it's going to set up right away. It's very sticky as we know. So there's less risk of fluoride ingestion. It's not, um, you know, in a gel or a foam, you know, version like we used to do and, um, you know, patients could swallow it. But what's great about varnish, you can just really get it into those dent and hypersensitive areas. And that is what it's indicated for, for dentinal hypersensitivity. So as you can see here, you wanna dry the tooth. You wanna dry those areas first. You wanna apply it with the brush and really get it on those spots really well. And that's how you can help treat and prevent sensitivity with fluoride varnish. And it doesn't take real long. It's very easy to do as we know. Um, typically we would do it as the last thing before we send that patient home. And fluoride varnish works really well. It can really um, provide that pain relief. It lasts, it gets down into those tubules. We also have the Colgate Professional Sensitivity Relief Serum. Um, this was formerly known as Anywhere, Anytime, but we have um, updated the name and we will have an updated um, Henry Schein dental number that um, will be um, published very shortly. But um, what it is, is an exclusive, it's arginine, which is a natural amino acid and calcium carbonate. It works um, instantly. It works within one minute. It is in a tube form and this tube can be used chair side. It can be, the patient can purchase the tube. Um, they can have a desensitizing treatment and have this as uh, what the treatment was. And they actually get to take their tube home. Um, one package for the profession that, um, that you can purchase for your office will have 10 tubes in it. So basically it's a fingertip application like I said, it works pretty much within one minute. And so this patient, that ouch, this hurts patient, sits down in the chair and starts telling you, you know, don't touch this tooth or this tooth or this tooth. I've had many patients do that. And you're thinking, well, that's gonna be a little difficult for us to provide treatment. Um, you know, sometimes in the past, we would just put topical on. And then, you know, that's just kind of a, a, obviously a temporary solution. It's not really doing anything for their hypersensitivity, but it's just kind of making them more comfortable during their dental procedure. And what we really want to do though, is really provide true sensitivity relief. Um, you know, I do know that personally, when I worked in periodontal offices, I worked for a periodontist who would use this on the areas where she was not um, doing procedures because this patient maybe has generalized hypersensitivity. So she would apply it in those other areas that weren't going to be numb for the day and it works. So um, within one minute and what you do is you actually apply it to your finger and you rub it in for about a minute and then you can rinse and you can go on with the procedure. You could apply it again at the end if you feel that's necessary or the patient actually can take it home and you show them. And uh, just kind of depends on the patient. They should get about 20 to 25 um, doses out of that tube. And you know, it might be a few weeks after they see you that they start to feel that sensitivity again, and they can just squeeze a little bit out. And so really that's the whole idea of it is one tube per patient and they have it at home for when they need to retreat themselves. So, um, you know, with the pro Argent technology, you know, like I said, it works in one minute. It basically occludes those tubules. It kind of acts like a magnet. It is attracted to the negative charge in the tubule and it just goes right down in there. Um, it does not create any splatter or aerosolization. It's, you know, very simple to use. It's in serum form and it works really well. So, like I said, we did go through a name change and a little bit of a packaging change. It's still in, tube, in a tubule form, uh, but instead of having a, a big case of 24, they can be purchased in just 10 tubes. Um, and it 
it looks a little bit, I guess, um, fancier on the counter there. But it's a great thing to have. It's definitely important to have um, as many treatment options as you can provide for those patients. So for home care, of course, Colgate Total is a stannous fluoride. It's stabilized with zinc phosphate. Um, it stays stable. They get that benefit of the occlusion of the tubules. And then a sensitive toothpaste, sodium fluoride, and 5% potassium nitrate. Both are great options for home care when just an over-the-counter toothpaste is sufficient. You also want to recommend a a softer brush. And sometimes those patients, they are so used to a hard bristle brush, you have to kind of kind of baby step them down. They might have to go to a soft brush and then you can try to get them on a sensitive brush. Um, our brush, the Slim Soft, is a really great brush for those patients who are over aggressive because sometimes they're over aggressive because they're making up for not flossing or getting interproximal. And the Slim Soft um, does get more interproximal. They do get a little bit of subgingival access, um, six times deeper than a, a regular bristle brush. Um, and about one and a half times deeper interproximal access. This is a really comfortable, um, very clean feeling toothbrush to recommend. So you have different treatment options for different patients. You could um, do a combination, soft bristle brushes, send them home with a prescription fluoride, do a varnish treatment at the end, um, you know, have them follow up and you know, see what's working for that patient. So some of the key takeaways today I'd like you to um, be aware of is, you know, the next time you have that sensitive patient in the chair, you can, you know, easily recommend a take home management, in office protocol, um, a combination, you can really help those patients to not have that pain, to feel better. Um, you know, to not be scared to come see you, to not associate the dental office with hypersensitive pain. And definitely using a differential diagnosis will assist you in that management and treatment of a very common condition. I want to say thank you. And I'm going to go through a couple of different patient types and some suggestions for them. So let's look at patient number one. This is a typical patient uh, that you will see in a general practice or periodontal practice, 54 year old male, he's perio maintenance patient, three month recall. So he comes in pretty regularly, but he has generalized recession, multiple sensitive areas. He's on medications for high blood pressure and allergies. So, you know, what do we know about when patients are on medications, especially allergy meds, high blood pressure medication, they cause xerostomia, right? And like when I talked about xerostomia, oftentimes another side effect of having dry mouth is you may have dent hypersensitivity. Also, this patient obviously has had some periodontal um, treatment in his history, and he's on three-month recall, all that recession. And so for this patient, there's a number of treatment options. I definitely um, would assess how many areas where they are, what kind of pain. I may talk to him about his diet, um, see where he's at with that, give some suggestions. And also um, we could do the sensitivity serum, right? You know, before we start, he could even purchase that tube and take it home. We may want to also do um, a prescription fluoride for sure. He's a periodontal maintenance patient, so he should be on a Prevident 5000 booster. Um, the sensitive would really be helpful for him um, to use on a regular basis. And you may even want to do a varnish treatment at the end for this patient. Patient number two, you have um, basically, that's me, 48-year-old huh? female, uh, severe dental hypersensitivity, avoids cold beverages, avoids dental visits, that part's not me, uh, and medications for anxiety, also not me, but, um, but you know, that is a typical um, diagnosis for a female at 48. You know, oftentimes this is when the hypersensitive areas really, you know, come about. And um, those are the patients that are avoiding cold beverages. They don't really want to go in. They're kind of nervous about it. They think it gets worse when they see you. Um, they may be on anxiety medications. And once again, and a lot, oftentimes those medications are 
causing xerostomia. And so um, this patient really would benefit from some um, in-office treatments. I would definitely um, do the arginine and calcium carbonate, the sensitivity serum, um, talk to her about that, do it before you do any um, procedures on her and um, talk to her about prescription fluorides and see, you know, where she's at with that, send her home with one so you can make sure she's using it correctly. And definitely um, some follow up, make sure to really emphasize to her to use it, to give it time, give it time to work and, um, and see if that helps for her sensitivity. Patient number three, you have the 36 year old female avoids brushing areas because of sensitivity. They are scheduled for scaling and root debridement and high consumption of diet soft drinks. You know, um, oftentimes, you know, that the problem with the, you know, I call it the diet soft drink, you know, kind of myth. Um, many people who drink a lot of diet soft drinks do so because they think it's healthier or it's better for them, or, you know, I'm not getting sugar. And so I can drink them all day long and I'm not causing any harm to myself. They're healthier, right? That's, you know, anybody I know who drinks a lot of diet soft drinks, that is what they believe. And unfortunately, as we know, they're very acidic. They are contributing most likely to the sensitivity. Um, you know, she's also avoiding brushing these areas because she's so sensitive. So she's getting more calculus and more plaque. And now she's getting scaling and root debridement. And um, she's going to be even more sensitive after that. She's um, hopefully going to have a lot of healing, but she's going to be um, have more areas that are exposed. And so definitely I would do some dietary um, counseling with her, talk to her about drinking water, um, talk to her about better ways to brush her teeth, maybe using, um, you know, a softer bristle brush to get in there. Some definitely some flossing, um, any way to clean her teeth that um, she's going to have to work on that, especially after going through scaling and root debridement. It's going to feel different to her. So I would also um, most likely recommend the sensitivity, sensitivity serum, do a treatment um, right then, and then have her go home with it so she can continue to use it. Um, and also you could do a varnish treatment and the prescription Provident. Um, all of these are really great um, tools that we have for these patients and um, seeing what works and seeing what helps them and, um, and go from there. And hopefully we can help relieve that dentin hypersensitivity for them. So I want to say thank you for um, listening to me today. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. I appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, Linda, for your time this evening. If anyone has additional questions about this topic, please email us at webinars at henryshine.com. Additionally, if you're interested in attending future Henry Shine webinars, visit henryshinedental.com slash webinars for our upcoming schedule. As a thank you for attending, everyone will receive the recording of this webinar via email in the next week. I'd like to thank you all for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you back here on future webinars.